this winter at Acme is your chance to experience a remarkable array of works from Tate's collection. Connected by the theme of light and spanning over 200 years, see incredible works from Turner, Kusama, Monet, Turrell, and many more. From one of the UK's most adored cultural institutions, see art in a new light. Light works from Tate's collection. Now open. So welcome everybody, welcome to this session, this Studio Arts session. My name's Susan. We're so delighted to be able to give you the insider information about our beautiful exhibition, Light, uh, works from Tate's collection. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that ACME is situated on, the Burunurung and um, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just to let you know that you're in the right zone, we're going to be covering all the, the areas that you need to cover for your studies. Uh, and we've got the experts here to fill you in on all the details. So we're super lucky because we have our chief curator, Sarah Tutton, who uh, is such a shining light in ACME's um, curatorial team. And she'll be telling you about her role and more about the exhibition. And we're gonna begin with her. And after Sarah has uh, filled you in on uh, some of her insights, we're going to be meeting Lucy Willett, who is our exhibitions coordinator. And she has got us so interested in things like pest control uh, that uh, I'm sure you're going to be uh, on the edge of your seats as well. Uh, so we'll just give them a little bit of a round of applause to get them, uh, get them energised. And uh, here's Sarah. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Sarah Tutton and I am a curator. And Usually curators come and talk about artworks and exhibitions, which I am going to do a little bit today, but I'm going to tell you more about what I do and who I work with and what our, I suppose, our purpose is. But before I start that, I'll give you a little bit of an intro about ACME. I assume most of you have been here before, but I know you've been here this morning. So we are the National Museum for the Moving Image, which covers everything from film, TV, video games, contemporary art, um, digital culture. And in the case of the exhibition you've just seen today, it also encompasses things like painting and photography and sculpture and installation. And I think that's quite an interesting proposition about how we think about what the moving image is and why a museum like us would show an exhibition from Tate, which is full of works that we don't often think of within the context of the moving image. Okay, so before I tell you about the show, I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do and who we are. So although my title is a curator, I actually think of myself as an exhibition maker. My role is to tell stories in space. So a theatre maker tells stories generally um, on the stage, a filmmaker makes it on the screen, exhibition makers bring things together, sometimes they're um, pieces of art, um, sometimes they're sort of archival objects or materials like costumes or films, etc. And put them in space, often working with architects and designers, and Lucy's going to talk a little bit about more about that, to tell a story. So the exhibition that you've seen today, Light, tells the story of light through the history of art. So to do that, we work with a big range of people. So in the exhibitions team, we have um, people like the Director of Exhibitions and Touring, which is my colleague, Chris Harris, um, who also thinks of himself as an exhibition maker. There's a lot of overlap between what I do and what he does. Um, we have exhibition managers, coordinators like Lucy. Um, we work with registrars, and I think Lucy's going to tell you much more about that. Conservators. Um, and then curators really look after, I suppose, more of the storytelling and conceptual part of that. But we couldn't do that if we weren't working with architects, designers, lighting designers, people who work in interpretation. So that's people who do the labels, um, write the didactics, do information on the website, etc. So it's a very, I suppose, diverse and multidisciplinary team that comes together to make a show. I think often people think that an exhibition just pops up overnight. Um, I think the install for this was seven days. seven days. It usually would have been three weeks. So that was a bit COVID impacted. Um, the development of an exhibition like this is probably anywhere between five years and three years. And at the hour end is about 18 months when it comes in as a touring exhibition. 
Okay, before I jump into light, I'll just tell you a little bit about our exhibition program and what we do in our big gallery that you've been down into. Um, we have both ticketed exhibitions, so exhibitions that you pay for, like light, um, Disney that we had on last year, um, Wonderland, which was about Alice in Wonderland on screen, and we have free exhibitions. But we work very, very closely with um, Visit Victoria, which is a government agency, on our ticketed exhibitions, and we call them Melbourne Winter Masterpieces. So Picasso at the NGV and Light here at Acme are both Melbourne Winter Masterpieces. And they're very focused on getting people in, having a great time in the city and sort of really experiencing culture in Melbourne. So we work very closely with different agencies to deliver these. So Light is an exhibition that was curated and developed at Tate in London. To give you a bit of a sense of what Tate is, it's home to the UK's National Collection of Art from around from 1500 to the present day, as well as international contemporary art. It has over 78,000 works of art in the collection, over which 35,000 of which are by JMW Turner, who is a key person in our light exhibition. Upon his death in 1851, Turner left his archive to Tate, which has since become known as the Turner Bequest, and is probably one of the most important collections in historical art in the world. Um, and is very much the starting point for this exhibition. So the Tate, some of you might have visited it in England. It's got a number of different um, sites, including the Tate Modern, which I think is one of the most visited cultural sites in the world. It's very exciting. So the Tate curators worked for a number of years. Um, there were two key curators who worked on it, Karen Greenberg and Matthew Watt. Um, Matthew came out with the exhibition. Um, to present it here. And they worked looking at the Tate collection, collecting works and trying to tell the story of light, both as a theme and as a media, using the paintings, the, photogra the photographs, the installations that they had in the Tate collection. And they've told this really beautiful story that weaves the past and the present and different ideas of light together that really to sort of make a bit of a pun of it, shed light on our understanding of light as both a subject matter and a media. This is Tate, so this is where the exhibition sort of began. So you can see that that's a very historical, we don't really have museums like this in Australia. Um, parts of the NGV look a little bit like this. It's not what Acme looks like at all. Acme is probably a little bit more like this, but not quite. This is the Museum of Art Pudong in Shanghai, and this is where the exhibition was first shown. Um, the museum in Shanghai was opening and light was its first exhibition. And there were huge queues in Shanghai to see this. So visitors were very excited about seeing the Turners and the Kasamas and there was a lot of buzz around that. Then went to Korea and now it's come here and then it's going off to New Zealand in a ship. So one of the things that we think about when we take an exhibition from somewhere else is how does it fit into Acme? And as Susan mentioned to me earlier, how do we Acmify it? How do we give it our own special flavour? How does it speak to our audiences? How does it fit into our space? As you've seen, our space is not a big, hollowed, historical space. Um, it's a dark screen, purpose-built gallery. Um, not particularly suited to historical painting. So we have to do a lot of work to make that feel right in our exhibition and that's very much what Lucy does. But one of the things we think about is how do we sell it to our audience? How do we convince people that what they want to do is spend their time and their money coming to Acme to see these objects? So one of the things we thought about a lot was how do paintings, historical paintings particularly, and really very much the Turners, how do they fit into the story of the moving image, which is the story that we want to tell here at Acme. And light is the thing that enables people to make cinema and make television, to tell stories with light. And Turner did that with paint. So there's a really nice connection between cinema, video games, television, and how that sits in a much broader history of painting, sculpture, etc., of art. So we did a lot of thinking about that. We thought about what title we would like the exhibition to have. We thought that people would be interested about Tate and that would be a bit of a brand that would pull people in. We did a lot of work with our um, audience and marketing team. 
we came up with the not very, um, I suppose, different, but light works from the Tate's collection, which really tells you what it is. So when you get here, you know what's happening. So this is a photo of some of the Tate collections and me looking very serious. Um, the man in the photo is Matthew Watts, who is actually Australian, but he is the Tate um, curator who came out with the exhibition. I'm going to quickly take you through the exhibition. So we come down the stairs. One of the first things we see is a David Batchelor work. Um, David Batchelor is a contemporary artist. He's Scottish. Um, he's made this work, Spectrum of Brick Lane, which is the first work you see. It's very contemporary. It's in many ways not what you see on the posters, which are much more historical works. Come down, you see this at the bottom of the stairs, and it really speaks to this idea of colour and light, which is, you know, without light, we can't see colour. It references Brick Lane, which is a very busy street in London, which is very well known for its um, Southeast Asian um, restaurants. Um, it's sort of bright inner city urban cityscape. That's the first thing you see before you go into this room. So the curators really wanted to create that connection between the past and the present. So you come into this room where you see these beautiful turners. This is um, after the deluge, which is the large painting with the sort of boundary around it. Um, this is the first time this has been shown in Australia. Um, it's a work that really delves into this idea of spiritual light. But on the other side, we see other turners which look at scientific light. So we have artists who are taking different angles on the same subject matter, but one from a spiritual perspective and one from a scientific perspective. Turner was a professor at the Royal Academy um, and had the title of the Professor of Perspective, which is quite a cool title. We then go into another very contemporary work by Lillian Lynn. Um, this is a work that, again, has a lovely connection. And this is one of the things that we do as curators is make visual connections between these circles here and these circles here. Now, these are made hundreds of years apart. But as you're wandering through the exhibition, you make these visual connections, which I think is really nice. We then move into this section, Sublime Light, which I think is super interesting because this painting here, um, which is of Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii, was actually high popular culture at the time. So unlike Turner, which was quite serious practice, it was quite abstract, it was very intellectual, um, this painting was very much about popular culture, giving people a sense of what Mount Vesuvius was like. It was often shown with a lot of pomp and ceremony and smoke and mirrors and very much part of early pre-cinema technology. We then move into interior light. Um, Hopefully you, some of you were tricked by this Philippe Perino work. We've spent a lot of time watching visitors in here and people walk in and go, how does this actually work? And tricking people and having that trick of light is something that the curators really wanted to happen in the centre of the exhibition. Philippe Perino is an artist, a French artist, who works largely um, in film and cinema, um, but also works in installation. And he's created this work which gives you a sense both of the passing of time in that the shadows in a room give you a sense of the day passing, but he also likes the fact that people walk on this carpet and you get a sense of the passing of time of the exhibition and it's going to become more and more scuffed as the exhibition goes along. Around that are these beautiful um, Wilhelm Hammershoi, who is a Danish painter's beautiful interiors, which I think have a very cinematic quality. Um, for those of you who might be interested in sort of noir cinema, I think there's a really nice connection between Hammershoy's interiors and a lot of the interiors that you might see in sort of early cinema. These are some um, works by Monet and sort of his contemporaries, which are very well known. In the middle, we have this Kasama work, which is incredibly contemporary and uses mirrors to create a sense of um, sort of engagement and intersection with yourself and light. Then we have Joseph Alberts, who is probably my, one of my favourite artists, um, one of the curators we were working with when she first saw these burst into tears. Um, Joseph Alberts was a Bauhaus artist and Bauhaus is really the point at which cinema becomes, and, and this history of art really intersect 
and cinema becomes part of art and art becomes part of cinema. It's a really important sort of historical moment for cinema. Um, Joseph Albers um, was part of a sort of large group of people who taught in the Bauhaus and really focused on craft and industry and process in a way that hadn't happened before. He was very interested in colour, has these beautiful colour paintings at the back. Um, and then we have these Maholi Naj photographs and a small video, um, which are sort of a different angle on Bauhaus practice. Maholi Naj is somebody that Acme has shown quite a lot before. He's very important in the history of cinema. And then we come to colour and light. So where we started with the David Batchelor and that Brick Lane installation, we come back to that later in the exhibition. And here are these um, Bridget Riley's work, which a lot of us think of as op art. She's quite famous for her sort of um, very colourful sort of optical artwork. She actually thinks of herself as an impressionist. And she's very, um, she's feels, she sees herself within the tradition of people like Monet and Manet. And then we come into the Oliver Eliasson and expanded light. So we're moving backwards and forwards between the past and the present and an understanding of light as something which is both a medium and a theme and can be shone in different ways in different parts of our lives for different purposes. Tessa Dean is a well-known British um, filmmaker. She predominantly works in 16 and 35 mil. Um, many of you probably know Christopher Nolan who made Interstellar and Batman and various things. Tassida and Christopher Nolan are good friends and spend a lot of time going around the world convincing people to keep celluloid and cinema alive. So she's part of a Save Film campaign, which I think is very important, but she works with somebody who's doing that in IMAX and multiplex and really makes that connection between um, experimental practice and that more mainstream practice. James Terrell, who is like a moving image, although it's actually a sculpture. Is it a sculpture, Lucy? Nearly. Installation. Installation. And then Liz Rhodes, who hopefully you saw in our Gallery 3. Now, all of those works came from Tate's collection. We were very keen to have some Australian work within this presentation. And so we commissioned Michaela Dwyer, who is a local artist, originally from Sydney, has been living in Melbourne and teaching at RMIT for the last couple of years, predominantly known as a sculptor. And she has made this amazing work called Weights of Light, which sits in our light well. Um, again, it's a sculpture. It's not the moving image. In fact, it doesn't have... Um, it, her original proposal for us had light within it, but actually this captures light rather than anything. It's very, very beautiful. We've had lots of little children particularly think that they were ice drops dropping on their heads, so they were a bit afraid of going under it. And then finally, before I pass over to Lucy, is our role as interpretation. So we could put all these artworks up and not talk to our audience about our views about them or ask our audience what their views are. But one of the key things we do is have what we call interpretation. So that's our labels, our didactic panels, um, information we have. Have you all got a lens? Yep. So when you go home and you go to what we call your, the website, which is your post-visit experience, you get more interpretation. That can be video um, interviews, it can be longer form essays, it can be... Um, photo essays, but it helps people have different entry points and learn more about the artworks. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Lucy. So I'm Lucy Willett, I'm the exhibition coordinator, and I suppose my role with Light is sort of like project management for the whole exhibition. Uh, so Light is in what we call Gallery 4, and for each exhibition we start with a big empty space that we build the exhibition into. So it's a challenging space because it's really long and narrow and we sort of have to get people to come down the stairs and then come back up and around and leave via the escalator. We want to make each exhibition look and feel different. So when people come back to Acme, they feel like they're in a different space each time. To do this, we um, engage an exhibition designer for a big show like something in uh, Gallery 4, we need this. And that person works closely with the curator and with the exhibition coordinator. 
For smaller exhibitions like upstairs in Gallery 3 where Liz Rhodes is, we do that all in-house and that's just sort of the exhibition coordinator, the curator and the artist working really closely together to develop the layout and we'll draw it up in 3D modelling software like SketchUp. Um, so for light, we engaged Anita GG Design. So the first stage of the process was the concept design where Anita would present her ideas to the exhibition project team at ACME. Anita was interested in referencing the architecture of Tate and so she brought in these arches to reflect what's in Tate Britain as part of the um, exhibition design to be transitions between each room. She was also interested in drawing out the colours from particular artworks to translate into the wall colours. So once uh, we'd got the general look and feel from Anita approved by the ACME internal team, we start getting into the detail and the floor plans. So the first step is the developed design, um, and that's when we start looking at what will actually fit in the gallery. So the original exhibition had about 120 artworks. We couldn't actually fit all 120 works, and when we couldn't have some of them on display because they're resting. So resting is a conservation term, which um, when we talk about an artwork and its period on display, they've, some objects had been on display in Pudong and then in Korea, so they've had their sort of maximum exposure to light and they need to rest while they're here at ACME. Um, this Pay White is an example of one of the works that was resting. So it's a work on paper. They're all little bits of paper that are thread onto a fishing line. And because it had had sort of its max fill of exposure, it had to rest when it came to Acme. Another one is this Anish Kapoor, Ishi's Light work. It was in the show, we really wanted it to be in the show, but it would not fit in the gallery. It would fit in the doors and that's as far as it would get. Was looking at demolishing staircases, walls, ceilings, balustrades, could demolish whatever we wanted, we still could not fit it downstairs. So we lost that one. So after we presented the detailed design to Tate to get their feedback, and then we can move into the detailed design. So from here, we made a bunch of changes based on their insight. One of the things that they said was that The Bachelor, that's at the start of the exhibition, and another work by Stephen Willits actually throw a lot of light and are better off in a space by themselves. So we cut the Willits from the show because we were already a bit on the fence about it, and we moved The Bachelor to where it is now at the start of the exhibition. So they also provided us install guides which detail exactly um, how each work needs to be displayed. So this can include how the artist wants it to be presented and it also tells us exactly how it fixes to the wall. The install guides also raised a number of issues which meant we had to change a bunch of things in the design. Um, so the Lily and Lynn and the Tacita Dean we originally had in quite open spaces, but once we got the install guide, we found that they actually need their own dedicated room. So we had to rejig everything to make that work. There was also a second Eliasson work, which was pretty space hungry. And that's something we had to lose to make up space to have individual rooms for the Lily and Lynn and Tacita Dean. So conservation is how we take care of the artworks while they're here at ACME. It's divided into two main areas, preventive conservation and interventive conservation. So preventive is what it sounds like. It's everything we do to prevent damage happening to an artwork. And then interventive is the sort of more fun and glamorous side of conservation where you get to treat an object or you do a treatment on an artwork. So it's interventive conservation is when you intervene with the artwork. So you might clean it, stabilize cracks, glue it back together or repair loss. And for a touring exhibition like Light, we mostly just employ preventive conservation. So the key preventive things that we use are controlling the environment, including the temperature and humidity in the air, controlling the light, light exposure on works, storing the artworks safely, making sure artworks are safe during transport, keeping the gallery and storage areas free from rodents and pests that might eat the work, making condition reports which outline the damage of the work so we can monitor and make sure nothing's changed, and then making sure things are safe and secure at all times. We've had 24-7 security from the moment artworks arrived here at ACME. Extreme or fluctuating temperature and relative humidity can be um, incredibly dangerous for art, damaging for artworks. So relative humidity is the amount of moisture in the air measured in a percentage. High or low temperatures or humidity in the air can cause cracking, flaking, warping, delamination, melting or adhesive failure. So to reduce the risk of damage to works, we control the environment in the gallery through air conditioning. 
It's part of our loan agreement with Tate that we have to keep the temperature between 16 and 25 degrees Celsius and the relative humidity between 40 and 60%. The humidity also can't change more than 10% over 24 hours. So different galleries have different requirements for what temperature an RH needs to be in the space. And different artworks likewise need different conditions and outdoor bronze sculpture can obviously withstand a lot more than an oil painting in light. Um, because air conditioning uses so much power, lots of museums and galleries are moving towards these broader parameters like light use because it's uh, sort of more environmentally friendly and everyone's just keen to reduce their impact on the environment. So light is also incredibly damaging to artworks. In particular, daylight to, is detrimental to an artwork because the UV rays can break down and fade a work. This is why lots of the galleries like our Gallery 4 have no windows or if we, they do have windows, they have UV filtering film. All light does damage an artwork though, which is why we limit the amount of light that falls on an artwork. Light is measured in lux, so when Tate provides the list of works, they also provide the maximum lux level for each individual work. Works on paper like the Constable Mezzo Tints or the Veronese photograms are very vulnerable to light damage, so their lux level is limited to 50. Oil paintings and acrylic on canvas like the Monet's or the Riley are more robust and can be lit up to 200 lux. Artworks like the Kusama are made of glass and mirror, and so they're not really vulnerable to light damage, but their light lux is limited because they're adjacent to works that are vulnerable. So as part of the design, we also engage a lighting designer and their sort of key outcome is that they need to make sure the light falling on each particular artwork is within the max lux levels provided by Tate. They use the existing lighting track and all the light fittings that we have to light the artworks and just the gallery generally. So they work closely with the exhibition designer and also designs the lighting within the arches as a lighting feature that draws out the architectural elements that Anita had designed. There's a little test up there of them sort of doing a proof of concept. So the key way we keep artwork safe is by monitoring their condition over time in a report. Before leaving Tate in London, one of the conservators prepared a report for each individual artwork. It details all the existing damage in the report and it includes pictures of the artwork which highlight where the damage is located. So when the works arrive at ACME, we unpack them and check the condition against the report. If there's a scratch or a crack or some loss that's not noted on the report, we know that it's new and it's happened in transit. So then we add this new detail to the report and so the next venue knows that that was there before it came to them. So in addition to the condition reports, we met with the Tate conservators over Zoom to go through artworks they were particularly worried about. They highlighted a handful of works that already have serious damage, so they wanted us to keep an eye on. You can see this Turner has extensive cracking in the paint layer, so the conservators just wanted to point that out so we we're aware of it. During these meetings, we also had the opportunity to learn about the history of damage to some of the artworks. This can help the conservators at our end to understand what to look out for when they're checking for new damage. One example is this John Martin work that was significantly damaged in a flood in 1928. The artwork remained damaged until 2011 when the Tate decided to undertake a big restoration project to fill the loss in the painting. Understanding this damage and the previous treatment helps our conservators know what to look for in the artwork. So we also have to keep objects safe while they're in transit. To do this, they're packed. we have to make sure they're packed with the right materials. Museum grade materials protect the artwork and are inert, which means they don't react with the artwork and cause damage. Like when you add ice cream to soft drink and everything foams up, that's a chemical reaction. Inert materials won't have a chemical reaction with anything they come into contact with. So they're then packed in specially made crates like these images. The crates help protect the works from any bumps and movement during transit. The artworks flew here from Korea on a climate controlled plane. Then they move off the plane to climate controlled trucks with air ride suspension so they don't bounce around too much as they, as they come to us. All of the artworks need to be insured while they're moving and then when they arrive at ACME. So bugs and rodents can completely destroy an artwork if they're left unchecked. Works on paper and textiles are particularly vulnerable and can be totally eaten by pests. This is why we don't allow any food or drink in the gallery because any crumbs or spills can attract pests that might then go on to eat an artwork. So we regularly spray for pests around the perimeter of the gallery. And we also use things like these sticky traps that if a bug walks onto, it'll get stuck on it. 
Um, and if your integrated pest management plan is working well, these sticky traps should have no bugs stuck on them. One of the OHS concerns with light was the, um, that a lot of the works are powered artworks and they might be really old, they might be a from a different country and have different plugs. So like the Flavin, the Batcher and the, the Eliasson all have powered elements that needed checking. So we engage an electrician to look over these powered works and make sure they're safe to be plugged in and they're not going to electrocute anyone, they don't have any live wires or anything like that. So the install guides I mentioned earlier also provide us a basis to plan for the installation. It details all the components of the artworks um, that we'll be receiving and how these all come together. The high value of many of the works in the show downstairs means that they also have special fixings so they can't be taken off the wall without special tools. And as part of the security for the show, we're not allowed to take any photos of the installation because images might reveal these security fixings and things that we just don't want people to know. So the guides also suggest what equipment we need to safely handle and install works, like this manual stacker here that we use to lift up some of the really heavy paintings to hang on the wall. And when handling artworks, we always wear gloves just to make, and because the oil and the sweat in your hands can damage artworks. And then for artworks like Terrell's Raymar Blue, the install guide essentially is the artwork. Tate provided construction documentation for the artwork and the builders built the room to their specification. The only artwork parts that Tate provided were actually the lights and everything else was built on site. So any deviation from the install guide, it means we have to go back to Tate and get approval for that from the artist studio. This kind of site specific work is known as an iteration of the artwork. And Philip Perreno's 6 p.m. is another site specific work. So the artist studio just supplied a plan of the motif of the window and told us which three colors of carpet it is. Um, the artist is super particular about the carpet, so we had to get it from Germany. And it came in big, three big long rolls of carpet that we had to get some artwork, uh, sorry, some carpet installers just to cut to size and install on site. And then it gets thrown out at the end of the exhibition and we have to sort of prove that we've destroyed it and no one's keeping a sneaky bit of a Perino work. So just while you're thinking of some questions, um, I have a few questions to ask uh, while everyone uh, is, uh, is loosening up because this is really such a wonderful opportunity for you to actually find out more about the exhibition so you can ask either Sarah or Lucy uh, some questions. But I was actually thinking about the fact that we've got um, uh, Chinese language on our labels as well and I was wondering about the, um, how that works. Um, that's very much an experiment for us. Um, we're obviously very interested in attracting new audiences to ACME and exploring what those audiences want from an experience here. So given the exhibition had come from Shanghai and the labels had already been translated into Mandarin, we decided to use them and we're doing some research at the moment to see how many visitors are using them, um, whether that's something we might do in the future, we might try some other languages in the future. Um, but I think, it, you know, Chinese-speaking visitors are quite a large audience within the city of Melbourne and at ACME, and it just seemed like an opportunity to provide that as part of our interpretation and see how it went. Do you have anything to add to that? It was also quite easy under these circumstances. The labels sort of design sort of had enough room to do it. We had the text, so we thought, why not? Um, how did you know that you wanted to become a curator and how did you achieve that? Um, I knew somebody would get asked that. I had no idea. <laughs> um, when I went to school, people had... My daughter, who was like your age, asked me this a few weeks ago. So I thought I would grow up and work in some glamorous kind of arty magazine kind of situation in a big studio with people who dressed nicely and were really arty. And somehow that led me here. I don't, I, and actually I was saying before, I left school when there was, I left school in 1988, which was when the recession, there was a big recession and there weren't really any jobs. And so people went to university or left school and did their thing, but it was, there were not particularly jobs in the arts at the time. 
So me and my friends started what's now called Artist Run Spaces. So we just went and did our own things. People went to art school. We created galleries. We put on events. Suddenly I found myself at 30 with quite a lot of experience in the arts and by that stage there were jobs in museums and in galleries and I'd sort of had a lot of experience from putting on our own things. So I probably had, Lucy's younger than me and she has, like I studied art history and cinema, but I, the courses to become a curator, a conservator, etc. didn't actually really exist in Australia when I came up through the system. So I sort of learnt on the job, whereas you studied conservation. Yeah, I did a Master's of Cultural Materials Conservation. Mm. And lots of our other curators did the, did the curatorial. But the older ones didn't. The class, the <laughs> course at there's Melbourne There's a Uni. Master's of Curatorial Studies at Melbourne Uni and there's a PhD program at Monash. But, yeah, I just like working with artists and it seemed like a good idea. Working with artists is the best part, yeah. definitely. Working with Makala Dwyer, both Lucy and She's I worked very closely with Makala <laughs> and that was just amazing. Working with an artist to kind of... she had We had a space and some money and we said, Makala, what do you want to do in this space? And she came up with different ideas and we workshopped it and... You know, just enabling somebody to create something that ambitious was really, it's quite a privilege to do that. So I'm actually wondering about some of the challenges for a moving image museum in terms of looking after these uh, precious artworks. There's lots of challenges. It's the first time I've ever had to sign in to go into the gallery after hours. We've got a lot more security, haven't we? Yeah, lots more security than we normally would because, you know, you can't really steal the artwork that's... A hard a, drive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, but you'd have to climb up into the rigging to get it. Um, so we've also got barriers in front of works, and that's something that Tate stipulated. So anything that has one of those barriers in front of it, Tate said we had to, and often it's because the painting might not have glazing. So some of them look like they don't have glass in front of them, but they do. So the big John Martin, for example, that doesn't have glass in front of it, so it has a barrier, so no one can touch the paint layer. And things like the Kusama, that big mirror box is just balancing on that glass plinth. It's like <laughs> super stressful. So if anyone knocked it, smash oh, it's dead. So it's, yeah, that's sort of why the barriers are there. And then our VX guides, visitor experience officers, they're sort of there to make sure no one's touching works and keeping everything safe. But we have more of them in this show than we would in our sort of regular shows and that's quite a large expense on top of the presentation of the show. Is it possible to like become a curator from the path of being an artist? Definitely, definitely. Um, there's lots of artist curator, curator artists um, and I think, I mean there are so many different ways to become a curator. I mean there are now these sort of courses you can do but people come from all sorts of different backgrounds I have a team of curators that probably range, you know, there's a 20-year age span in my team and I've got one person who'd be in her mid-20s. Um, she studied, she actually went to art school. She went to art school and she runs a really fabulous uh, sort of artist collective. Um, she's got a lot of experience um, working with young artists and putting on events and... Yes, so there are different, many different ways to become one. And she's also still a practising artist yeah. and lots of curators are practising artists and lots of arts workers in general to sort of to support their art practice. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I just had a question around, um, say an artwork arrives damaged. Um, will the process of repair take place here at Acme or will you send it a very good question. away to get repaired? It depends on the damage. So Acme does, we actually only have one conservator in-house and she's a time-based media conservator. You're a conservator. Oh, w one that works as a conservator. <laughs> um, so we get in contract conservators. So we would see the damage. We would call Tate, um, tell them what it is and send them photos and everything. And they might give us approval to do the treatment here or they might ask us to send it back. So it sort of depends. Um, if it was quite significantly damaged, it also might not be able to go back to London without fixing it first. So, yeah, it would depend on what Tate said we could and couldn't do. And anything, we would have to give them a really detailed plan of what treatment we were going to do step by step and they would approve everything from the materials to, yeah, 
um, who was doing it. Who's responsible for the damages if it's through shipping? It's, yeah, it's sort of, it is the, the shipping companies. We only use like um, artwork shipping companies. So they're sort of specialist from like your Australia Post or something. And it just kind of falls to an insurance claim. Like sometimes things can't be helped. Um, it, it might just be one of those things. But if, if there's sort of been willful damage while something's here, um, people can be charged for it, but it is quite hard if someone like actually went up and damaged your work. And then if something's damaged in handling, you know, it's sort of our fault and it falls to our insurance, but those things do sort of happen. It's so, all heavily insured. Yeah. The insurance for this show was enormous and we had to get a government grant to pay for it. Um, when you have the, uh, like, plaques and everything with all of the information, <laughs> how do you guys, like, the written out ones at the start, do you guys come up with that or the creators or is that from tape um, in this um, kind of exhibition? So in this case, they were originally written at tape. So Matthew Watt, who was the assistant curator, wrote them. Um, we tend to, when they've come from somewhere else, we then sort of put them through our lens. So I have a writer on my team, and so he looks at them, looks at Australian context, so are there words or references to experiences that may not make sense here? We put a lot of work into the interpretation. I think, you know, because we look at everything from video games, film, TV to art, we want to treat all those all that content with the same seriousness and rigor but we also want to speak to audiences in a way that is at their level so we don't want to put anything in those labels that is alienating or confusing or so we use as simple language as we can but we want the ideas and concepts to be as rigorous and intelligent and sensitive as they can be so it's a really um rigorous process, what we actually do is we write them, we print them up, we put them in a room and we get a group of people and we all walk through them and we go, okay, does that make sense to you? Is that referring to something that you don't understand? Like when we were preparing this talk, Lucy was talking about inert objects and I was like, oh, chemicals. And I was like, I don't, unless they've done chemistry, they won't know what that means because I don't know what that means. So we do a lot of that kind of thing of just sense checking how we talk about the artworks. And then all of the post-visit stuff, we've got lots of... So the, the website you log in with your lens, um, we've got lots of people who've contributed to that. So it might be the curators from Tate, it might be the curators mm. here, and we might have got someone freelance to write some things that maybe just knows a lot about one particular work. Mm. I found that your uh, discussion of the range of temperatures that we're allowed to have in the gallery and the fact that it's changed over time because of environmental issues very interesting and I'm not sure that... Um, I think that maybe you could go over it again for the students just to explain what the uh, parameters used to be and how they've changed. So 40 to 60% has been pretty standard um, and 16 to 25 is... It used to be a bit smaller but just to try and keep a gallery sort of within one or two degrees of the right temperature at all times is such a drain on the air conditioning and it's just such a huge environmental impact. Um, and then there's been a lot of research done in conservation where they're sort of sense checking that, like how strict do we really have to be? And I would say the thing that is the biggest problem for all artworks is if the relative humidity goes really fastly up or really fast down, that's when you get problems. Things like bark paintings, if they get really warm, the, the wood exp uh, ex expands. And then if they get really cold again, it contracts and it can cause big cracks. Bark paintings are one of those things that it happens to a lot. Um, and then sometimes it's taken into account with the way things are mounted, especially with bark paintings, you'll see that they have sort of have little clips at the top of the bottom and there's actually a little bit of movement in that so that things like things that like wood, they can move around a little bit while they're on display without being damaged. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think conservation can be really wasteful as well because you want things to be clean all the time, you keep using things and so sort of just taking a step back and seeing how can we throw out less stuff and how can we have less of an impact on the environment. Considering that I saw a few um, more contemporary artworks within the gallery, especially on the upper layers, 
considering video games and cinematography and all that, what is the um, museum's opinion and Tate's opinion to things like m digital art? We see all those things as just as important as each other. Um, and we're very aware that our audiences have a strong interest in digital culture. I suppose one of the things that's really important to us is how do we show digital culture in a way that is different to how you might experience it at home? So how do we show something that you can see on your phone um, and interpret it differently and give you a different experience in the gallery. And video games is a good example of that. So you'll notice with the video games that we show, you don't just get the video game, but you also, there's interpretation around it, there's artworks that sit alongside it, so that you have an understanding of how those things are made, what the artists were thinking about when they were developing them, etc. Because I think, you know, you can access a huge amount on your phone. You can watch films on your phone. So why would you come to the cinema and watch them? Why would you go into the gallery and watch, um, you know, a video artwork? So we think about that a lot. But for us, we're, you know, fascinated in all those things. We have programmers and curators who have different specialisations and subject matter expertise and we like to have a team that has all those different interests. And we have Gallery 5 as well which has digital works like yeah. that's had a video game on it and it has lots of video works that are just accessible from the website. Mm. So I might just get you just to uh, cover the, uh, the Lilian Lin lamp. I think that might be quite interesting for the students. So this is one of the conservation measures um, for this particular artwork because it's 1967 and it's 1967 electronics. They're not great. So we limit the amount of time that it's running each day um, just for less wear on the motor and less wear on the lamp. And the lamp, because it's an original part of the work, also is an old bulb that gets really hot. So we just kind of turn it off to let everything cool down after a while. This work is... Um, was such a huge pain in the ass to install. Can I ask Lucy why um, the tape wouldn't replace those parts? Because it's an original part of the work. So sometimes things do get replaced, like the Terrell, all of the, the lights that come with that are brand new. They're new LED lights and they wouldn't have been that in 1969 when he made the work. So it sort of depends on the artist. And I think Lily and Lynn thinks that this particular lamp and this particular motor are integral to the work, so you can't change it, which also does mean that some kinetic sculptures uh, or powered artworks that are a bit older, they might become obsolete and not be able to be used again. That happens with video games all the time. So the newer the technology, the more likely it is to become obsolete quickly, unfortunately. Can I ask about like your resting periods? Because you talked about how, who decides upon what artworks are rested and are they rested at Acme or are they go back to London? So they're resting here. They're in um, storage that's off site. So the whole show travels together no matter what we fit in and what we don't. So everything we didn't fit or is resting is in Australia at off site storage. Um, the resting period can be a little bit arbitrary. So Tate just kind of decided that. I think everything has been on display in Pudong and then in Korea. And so they just, it's sort of probably six or seven months in total of straight up display time. So they're just, they just decided that it's resting now. And then when it goes to Auckland, some of those things probably won't be resting. But it would also depend on the work, that pay white, Coloured paper fades so easily, but if it was sort of a black and white drawing, it might not fade as much, so they might let it go for a bit longer. It can be a bit... So, yeah, it depends on the work, depends on the institution. It can be a bit subjective. Let's give uh, Sarah and Lucy a huge round of applause. Thank you I hope for that you've learnt <laughs> a lot today. <laughs>